Hello, Kenyan Christians. How do we read the Bible politically? A few quick principles. Number one, ask which covenantal audience the author has in mind. At the risk of oversimplification, we can say that Genesis 1 to 11, in some sense, are directly applicable to all humanity. Genesis 12 to the end of the Old Testament are directly applicable to ancient Israel. And the New Testament is directly applicable to the church, with some exceptions made for the transitional nature of the Gospels and Acts. Now, all the Bible is relevant for the church and all humanity in one sense, as we discussed above, but hear me out. The Bible is structured by covenants, both common and special. The common covenants were given through Adam and Noah. The special covenants were given through Abraham, Moses, David, and Jesus. What's critical is this. Those covenants were given to specific groups of people. The Mosaic Covenant, for instance, was given to the people of Israel. It wasn't given to the Babylonians. It wasn't given to you and me. Why aren't we bound by the laws concerning shellfish or clothes made out of mixed material? Because it belongs to the Mosaic Covenant, not the new. My only point is, the fact that the audience is Israel means I'm not going to apply any of its laws direction to myself much less the country. A similar principle applies to the New Testament. Jesus says to love your enemies and turn the other cheek. Does that mean the country should never go to war or that policemen should never use force? No. Jesus' intended audience here is members of the New Covenant in their relationship with one another. Number two, ask what the author's intention is, what the author is saying and not saying, and to whom he is saying it. Go back to Proverbs 22.7. The borrower is a slave to the lender. It's to signify certain subjective and objective realities that will accompany indebtedness and to suggest that you might want to avoid it in many circumstances. At the same time, there are surely times when borrowing money is necessary and a wise government might decide to get involved in various lending practices in order to protect the very ones whose circumstances require them to take out loans. Number three, consider what God has specifically authorized government to do and whether there is a precedent with universal normativity. What has God authorized government to do? The answer we'll find in Genesis 9, 5 to 6, with a useful elaboration in Romans 13, and in particular, historical episodes such as Joseph or Solomon. The point here is, any time we are considering a particular biblical principle, we want to ask the question, has God specifically authorized government to do that? He's clearly authorized government with the right to render judgment when lives are at stake. Can we build a case for universal health care from that basic principle? Some might say yes, some might say no. We don't need to answer that question right now, but that's where the conversation needs to happen. When we examine other biblical passages or principles, furthermore, we'll want to hold it up against this primary question of what government has explicitly been authorized to do. Number four. When it comes to the relationship between law and sin, our duty to the government depends in part on whether something is being proscribed or prescribed, criminalized or subsidized. Christians should never support laws that positively prescribe or subsidize sin. State lotteries, for instance, positively support and encourage gambling. So with same-sex marriage, it financially incentivizes and encourages sexual sin. That's different from saying we should criminalize gambling or criminalize sexual immorality. Just because something is a sin does not mean we should criminalize it. Which sins should be criminalized? To answer that, we'll need to consider what God specifically commissions government to do.
Any activity which brings clear and positive harm on another human being should be criminalized, like murder, stealing, physical violence, and so forth. Obviously, it's not easy to determine what constitutes harm. I'm just saying that's the conversation we need to have for figuring out which sins should be made criminal. When all Israel heard the king's decision, the people were in awe of the king, for they saw the wisdom God had given him for rendering justice. 1 Kings 3.28 Finally, friends, we and those in charge need justice. Let's pray for wisdom. These are excerpts from What Christians Should Do for Government, Obey Scripture, Get Wisdom, from the Nine Marks website. We need God's help. The true significance of life is that God made human beings in his own image with precious value. And that value, that significance, consists in knowing God, loving God, showing God. From the Desiring God website. Thanks for watching. Bye.